Lowell Thomas speaking, flashing to you the news of the world, pictured by Fox Movie Tone. <laughs> Five and a half million dollar luxury liner as she looked when homeward bound on her ill-fated trip from Havana with 558 aboard, mostly holiday tourists returning to New York. Three nights later, a flaming hulk on a raging sea. Upwards of 200 are dead or unaccounted for in the most appalling steamship disaster on the Atlantic seaboard since the excursion boat General Slocum burned 30 years ago with over a thousand lives lost. Resting the fury of a violent storm, the doomed ship was seven miles off the Jersey coast when a night watchman making his rounds at 3 a.m. discovered the library ablaze. Minutes later, an SOS crackled above the wind and the rain and vessels went steaming to the rescue. The fire, meanwhile, was taking terrible toll. Lifeboats were burned before they could be launched. The blistered side of the liner bears grim evidence of the fact that only eight boats were successfully released from the Morrow Castle. The specter of death was everywhere. It first appeared on the bridge of the liner hours before the disaster when Captain Robert Wilmoth, master of the ship, died a victim of a heart attack. As the walls of flame enveloped all but the forward section, scores leaped into the sea to escape the searing heat and smoke. Many were trapped in their cabins when fire engulfed their companionways. Passengers with heads through portholes screamed frantically for help. As the murky dawn broke on the turbulent sea, movie tone surveyed the scene in all its grim reality. Men and women clinging to anything afloat until exhausted and numbed by the cold they could cling no longer had disappeared beneath the choppy waves. The graphic scenes of the disaster were filmed by an amateur who was a passenger on the Monica Bermuda, one of the first ships to reach the burning Morro Castle. Here's the tense moment as the first lifeboats reach the side of the rescue steamer. With close views of the blazing liner and its scores of panic-stricken humans, many of them so frightened they wouldn't trust themselves to the small craft in the rough seas. The fire was at its worst as the maker of these pictures leaned over the rail with his small hand camera to record the appalling scene. On New Jersey shore, natives of Spring Lake, Point Pleasant, and Seagird gaze out over lashing breakers for signs of survivors. Beyond the surf, a lifeboat is seen fighting its way in. As the day wears on, the storm increases in violence, making the treacherous rocks and combers more of an ordeal than ever. Here's one of the lifeboats coming to the end of its terrifying experience, bringing its human cargo to the haven of the shore. Passengers and crew, shivering and nerve-wracked by the torment of the night, wait pathetically to be taken into the care of willing hands. Every available doctor and nurse from miles around has been called into active duty to administer aid to the sea-battered survivors. Oxygen and pole motors are at a premium as frantic calls are broadcast for help and supplies. In many instances, help has come too late. Crippled and dazed, they come literally up from the sea. Relief agencies have been taxed to exhaustion by the steadily increasing casualty. The critically injured amongst them are given such aid as is available at the emergency stations and then borne away for better care. Pathetic sights such as this are to be seen wherever one may look. Anxious relatives in heart-rending anxiety pour nervously over the scene looking for loved ones whom fate may have spared. Governor Moore of New Jersey inducted into service the entire facilities and personnel of the National Guard to render all possible assistance. Coastwise steamer Andrea F. Lookenbach brings in 22 survivors. Seaman Quinn tells of the rescue. Getting closer, we saw that were people on both ends of the boat hollering and shrieking and crying for help. We cheered them on a bit and they, they then cheered us. We saw a number of bodies floating around that was apparently already dead, so we made no attempt to get them as uh, we are in a rush to get to the living. New York police board the boat and carry off the victims, most of them women, suffering from shock and cold. There were many pitiable sights, the survivors bedraggled and wet, still wearing the scant night clothing in which they left the Morrow Castle. Here's one of the rescued women, still plainly unnerved by her terrible experience. I was in the water for about an hour, I guess, and uh, I don't know what time the boat was sunk. I don't know. Please, don't make closing. The steamer City of Savannah arrives at New York with 65 more survivors, and the heart-rending scenes are repeated. On stretchers, the sufferers are rushed to hospitals and homes. Here are some of the crew of the Morrow Castle, with other lucky ones on the deck of the Monarch of Bermuda. Watch the faces as one of their numbers tells their story. Morrow. We looked over the side of the rail, 
and we saw the middle part of the ship was entirely in flames, and believe me, there were some flames. And they start shooting, they start shooting back toward us, and we all had to get to the back of the boat. And the smoke was coming up on us, and the flames were about 15 feet within us. Well, we were standing there for three hours before any help came in sight. We're only about five miles offshore, and the smoke was choking us so that everybody wanted to jump overboard. We're just about getting ready to, well, getting ready to die, I guess. And then I slid down the rope, and the, the, I laid in the water, I guess, an hour before the boat got to us. And when the boat got to us, these two young men, only for them, I think one of their names is Hammond, and I forget the other boy's name. But only for them, I never would have been here to speak. Well, the crowd behaved beautifully. I never saw anything as cool, calm, and collected. Finally got down. Somebody said, jump. Quite a few people did. I wouldn't jump. No, I'd stick. If I had to go down with the ship before I jump. That's what I thought then. I changed my mind about 15 minutes later. Had to climb down a rope. Got all the way down and thought, oh, well, this is the end. I hung on for about an hour. And I'm terribly bruised, but awfully, awfully happy that somebody came to find me at last. In the confusion and excitement, my wife must have went over the rail. I haven't seen her since. I don't know whether she's alive or not. Captain Francis of the Monarch of Bermuda, who brought into New York the greatest number of survivors, 71, is a modest hero. I really haven't much to say about this uh, terrible disaster. It's just a little difficult to talk about anything like this. But the only thing I can say is that I'm terribly glad that uh, w my crew and myself were instrumental in saving the 71 lives. If there's any credit due, I want my crew to get the credit because uh, without their cooperation, I, I couldn't possibly have done what I did do. Uh, I really haven't any more to say, only I do hope I never see another sight like that as long as I'm going to see. <laughs> The power of the sea is used to float the Morro Castle. Lines fixed to the stern of the hulk are firmly anchored at the other end to the bottom of the sea. With the rise and fall of the tide and waves, the Morro Castle rises and falls. The lines tighten and slacken, and when they grow slack, powerful winches aboard the hulk draw them in tight again. Then the movement of the sea puts a giant pull on the lines and budges the hulk. There's danger that the ponderous iron wreck might get free and crash against the piers or the Asbury Park Convention Hall. So a salvage tug stands in readiness to throw a line and hold the hulk if need be. Look close. You can see her rise and fall almost perceptibly. The stormier the weather, the higher the waves break, and the faster they can move the wreck. The Morrow Castle, blasted by fire, being pulled off the beach by storms. <laughs> Now to become the victim of dynamite, the Mohawk before she was rammed and sunk off the Jersey coast. 1,900 pounds of dynamite to shatter the huge iron hull on the bottom of the sea. The Mohawk foundered in shallow water, a menace to coastwise navigation. So with chains of dynamite, they're going to blast the wreck, one explosion after another. A diver descends repeatedly and places the charges. When one blast has ripped asunder one part of the steel structure, he makes another trip to plant another charge. So there's to be a series of detonations until the hulk is flattened out. The diver returns, dynamite planted inside the hull where it will blast the hardest. So throw the switch. Debris, a life belt blown to the surface, then two more explosions. This time he has brought up the ship's bell, blown loose. And now he has placed the last blasting charge. The undersea end of the Mohawk. British fleet, Italian liner on fire. International drama in the Egyptian harbor of Alexandria. 
threat of war and not so much friendliness between British and Italian ships, in steamed the liner Ausonia on a cruise, passenger list of tourists. Suddenly, an explosion, like a cannon shot or a bursting bomb. Aboard the British ships, everybody rushed to deck. They saw smoke pouring from the Ausonia. Her boilers had burst. She was afire. No international crisis now, only the old law of the sea. The British fleet rushing swift aid to the stricken Italian liner and firefighting. Six men killed by the boiler explosion, everybody else saved. Amid alarms of war, a gallant gesture of humanity. A fire blasted ruin, a floating torch among warships crammed with high explosives. Mm -hmm.